Welcome back to the Savage Nation. Now we move on to something I've been waiting to play for you all night. I played it once before in my radio career, and it's it's so beautiful. Let me set it up, and then we'll play it. This is Henry Miller, the great American author, reading from one of my favorite novels, Black Spring, which kept me going in many of the blackest phases of my life. I would read it over and over again. And it's about family, but in a way that you're not going to expect. So let's listen to Henry Miller reading from his great novel, Black Spring, right now on The Savage Nation. It always seemed astounding to me how jolly they were in our family, despite the calamities that were always threatening. Jolly in spite of everything. There was cancer, dropsy, cirrhosis of the liver, insanity, thievery, mendacity, buggery, incest, paralysis, tapeworms, abortions, triplets, idiots, drunkards, ne'er-do-wells, fanatics, sailors, tailors, watchmakers, scarlet fever, whooping cough, meningitis, running ears, chorea, stutterers, jailbirds, dreamers, storytellers, bartenders, and finally, there was Uncle George and Tante Amelia. The morgue and the insane asylum. No one knew that Tante Amelia was com going completely off her nut. That when we reached the corner, she would leap forward like a reindeer and bite a piece out of the moon. And nobody could think quick enough to stop it. Just like that it happened. In the twinkle of a star. And now I'm going to tell you what those bastards said to me. They said, Henry, you take her to the asylum tomorrow and don't tell them that we can afford to pay for her. Fine. Always merry and bright. The next morning, we boarded the trolley together and we rode out into the country. If Mealy asked me where we were going, I was to say to visit Aunt Monica. But Mealy didn't ask any questions. She sat quietly beside me and pointed to the cows now and then. She saw blue cows and green ones. She knew their names. She asked what happened to the moon in the daytime. And did I have a piece of liverwurst by any chance? During the journey, I wept. I couldn't help it. When people are too good in this world, they have to be put under lock and key. There's something wrong with people who are too good. It's true Mealy was lazy. She was born lazy. It's true that she was a poor housekeeper. It's true she didn't know how to hold on to her husband when they had found her one. When Paul ran off with the woman from Hamburg, she just sat in a corner and wept. The others wanted her to do something, put a bullet into him, raise a rumpus, sue for alimony. But Mealy sat quiet. She wept. She hung her head. She was like a pair of torn socks that are kicked around here, there, everywhere, always turning up at the wrong moment. And now she's very tranquil, and she calls the cows by their first name. The moon fascinates her. She has no fear because I'm with her, and she always trusted me. I was her favorite. Even though she was a half-wit, she was good to me. The others were more intelligent but their hearts were bad. Sometimes when she was fired from a job, they used to send me to fetch her. Mealy never knew her way home. And I remember how happy she was whenever she saw me coming. She would say innocently that she wanted to stay with us. Why couldn't she stay with us? I used to ask myself that over and over. Why couldn't they make a place for her by the fire? Let her sit there and dream if that's what she wanted to do. Why must everybody work, even the saints and the angels? Why must half-wits set a good example? I'm thinking now that after all, it may be good for Mealy where I'm taking her. No more work. Just the same, I'd rather they had made a corner for her somewhere. Walking down the gravel path toward the big gates, Mealy becomes uneasy. Even a puppy knows when it is being carried to a pond to be drowned. Mealy is trembling now. At the gate, they are waiting for us. The gate yawns. Mealy is on the inside. I am on the outside. 
They are trying to coax her along. They are gentle with her now. They speak to her so gently. But Mealy is terror-stricken. She turns round and runs toward the gate. I'm still standing there. She puts her arms through the bars and clutches my neck. I kiss her tenderly on the forehead. Gently, I unlock her arms. The others are going to take her again. I can't bear seeing that. I must go. I must run. For a full minute, however, I stand and look at her. Her eyes seem to have grown enormous. Two great round eyes, full and black as the night, staring at me uncomprehendingly. No maniac can look that way. No idiot can look that way. Only an angel or a saint. When I ran away from the gate, I stopped beside a high wall and burying my head in my arms, my arms against the wall, I sobbed as I had never sobbed since I was a child. Meanwhile, they were giving Mealy a bath and putting her into regulation dress. They parted her hair in the middle, brushed it down flat, and tied it into a knot at the nape of the neck. Thus, no one looks exceptional. All have the same crazy look. Whether they are half crazy, or three-quarters crazy, or just slightly cracked. When you say, may I have pen and ink to write a letter, they say yes, and they hand you a broom to sweep the floor. If you pee on the floor absent-mindedly, you have to wipe it up. You can sob all you like, but you mustn't violate the rules of the house. A bug house has to be run in orderly fashion, just as any other house. When Mealy stood at the gate with eyes so bright and round, her mind must have traveled back like an express train. Everything must have leaped to her mind at once. Her eyes were so big and bright, as if they saw more than they could comprehend. Bright with terror, and beneath the terror, a limitless confusion. That's what made them so beautifully bright. You have to be crazy to see things so lucidly, so all at once. If you're great, you can stay that way, and people will believe in you, swear by you, turn the world upside down for you. But if you're only partly great, or just a nobody, then what happens to you is lost. Well, that was one of the greatest pieces of American literature, Henry Miller reading from Black Spring. I hope you understand why I played it for you tonight. I guess there's a number of reasons. One, because it shows you that in every family there is such tragedy that we all don't want to talk about, we look away from, and yet it's part of the human condition. Secondly, Henry Miller was one of the greatest influences in my life, both as a human being and as a writer. Thirdly, it's very personal to me because of my brother, uh, my silent brother, which is a, a short, short story in uh, in um, in, uh, in train tracks. And of course, you know, I have a picture of my brother in the book. And every time I think about him and the snake pit they sent him to, I I remember that story by Henry Miller. Thank God, I I don't really know what he, what he felt. I don't know. I have no way to know. Nevertheless. It's part of life, it's part of the human condition, and I guess maybe it'll help you understand that none of us are perfect, no families are perfect, except within the imperfection is the perfection. That's about all I can say on this right now. If you care to comment on uh, any of this, again, you can call me at 855 Henry Miller, I just want to go back to him for a minute. I think Henry Miller was more appreciated certainly 20 years ago or 30 years ago than he is today. I don't know who is appreciated as an author anymore. I think that with the advent of the uh, social networking and iPhones, I, I don't know. I don't know what people love. I have no idea what people relate to. I don't know if the human soul is still living. I don't know if the human soul can still live. I don't know if people have any compassion or sentiment or any of these things anymore. It's hard to tell what people really feel. Maybe we've all been anesthetized by our society and by the times. I don't know. 